Greetings class. Welcome to another edition of our uh, lecture series for this uh, class using talking about PSYOP. Uh, this is chapter 2 in uh, PSYOP book, which is uh, making content comprehensible uh, for English language learners. This is the PSYOP model. Um, if you do have questions, please raise your hand and uh, I won't be there to help you, but uh, you can talk to me afterwards using Skype or email. Uh, let's start off here as we go. This is the beginning, the little chart that they have there at the beginning, and they're talking about uh, lesson preparations, and that's what this chapter is all about. The primary component that they're going to be talking about are uh, the objectives, uh, the content objectives and the language objectives, and uh, they do stress the uh, need or the idea that we should let our students know what these objectives are. I uh, completely agree with this, by the way. When you have uh, goals and you have objectives for every class, you should let the students know what they are, what it is they're trying to accomplish. You want to give them something to aim at. As one of my teachers used to always say, if you aim at nothing, you will probably hit it. So give them something to aim at. They may not succeed. That's OK. They're still moving up. Uh, and you see that they have an objective for the class. So try to give them objectives. Give them baby steps give them objectives that you believe they can reach. The other thing you want to remember, however, is that there are a lot of people who do not believe they can succeed. So at, in, in one sense, you want to give them goals that you believe they'll be able to make, but you also want to push them. You also want to push them to recognize they can do more than they realize. Okay. And the other thing, of course, that's in the book is that you want to have both language and content objectives, which is atypical from uh, from the other types of uh, straight ESL where they only have language objectives. Well, because this is our content courses, you're going to want to have both. Uh, this, by the way, is the whole lesson today. I'm just running through here really quickly. Appropriate content uh, concepts, you're just going to make sure that it's appropriate for their age, for their level, for their motivation. Okay? If they're not motivated in materials, then you want to try to find some other way to make it interesting. Um, this, it's the same thing with the objectives. You know, you're going to give them objectives, something that they can reach at, but it's got to be interesting to them. It's got to be motivating to them. It's got to be meaningful to them, as they put right here, right? It's got to be meaningful. Uh, hopefully, you'll have supplemental materials, and then they're going to talk about adapting content. And then at the end of every chapter, there is a sample of you've got three, uh, two or three teachers, and they're all doing something in the class, and you analyze it. And that's the observation protocol element of PSYOP, of the structured, uh, uh, structured, uh, and shel I'm sorry, sheltered instruction. Um, okay, and then the observation protocol. So uh, that's what the last part is for every chapter. All right, objectives, clearly defined, should be easy for you as an English language teacher to do. It will mean that you need to make it understandable by the students, not by anybody else. Make sure that it's displayed. Make sure that it's reviewed. Now, when I say displayed, it could be in the syllabus. It could be in the activity sheets that you're doing. When I taught ESL courses, I created a little list on the side of the side of the. Uh, uh, bulletin board, blackboard, or whiteboard, or whatever it was, and listed those are the things we're going to be doing today. I covered those elements in class so that they knew what we were aiming at. Those same types of things you can put on the syllabus. Um, because again, we're dealing with content. You should have content objectives and you should have language objectives. Again, you as a teacher, if you're going to be using the color approach, which is a model that we're going to be looking at later on, you'll also going to be adding affective, behavioral types of uh, objectives as well. Um, so, you want to have the objectives, make sure that they know them, make sure that they're meaningful, make sure that they're achievable. Um, you're going to want to work with some concepts, content concepts, so that they can understand what are the basic ideas in those. You may have supplemental materials that uh, you use in order to help them understand the objectives. And again, you're trying to adapt them according to the interest, the level. Uh, the language level and the motivational uh, areas of the students, right? Meaningful activities. Uh, PSYOP also puts great emphasis on uh, academic English. So in one sense, meaningful here is the ability to succeed in an academic setting, in a high school or in a grammar school or even in a college setting. Um, obviously, the practical is also good, but we're in a different environment here. We're in an academic setting. We should try to have <coughs> academic type of objectives. 
Again, objectives should be clearly defined, displayed, reviewed, and so should they should be doubled, right? The language and objectives. Uh, writing objectives. Um, there's a, some emphasis here on incorporating language objectives into the content of the course. That's the hallmark of PSYOP. Um, in my opinion, that should be the hallmark of any type of sheltered instruction, content-based instruction. Um, so, again, I don't believe this is anything new. If you're teaching a history course on, you know, uh, uh, on Australia and you're teaching the history of Australia, well, you've got all that content, but you need to break down what are the vocabulary items that these students need to master, what are the language functions, what are the skills, what are the tasks, I'm sorry, what, what's the grammar that they're going to need to know, what types of tasks can I give them to help them uh, learn the content while still also learning the grammar, what are some language learning skills that I can embed embed into the into the lesson so those are the six things that they say you want to try to incorporate into a content lesson again you're teaching geography you know world geography or you know uh, European geography you're gonna to want to look at all those six elements again what vocabulary do I need to include do I need to cover do I need to make sure they know what language functions can I put into this lesson that they don't know yet that we can try to help them develop our language skills what grammar can I input into this um, that they may need to know for the reading if there is a reading or a, 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 you know a video or something that they need to do uh, or tasks that they're going to need to be able to complete. What are they? Can I help them along? Can I give them this pre-setup stuff before they go on? And finally, what language learning skills might I be able to put in here to help them uh, learn to become more independent learners? Okay. The next section here in the book talks about uh, supplemental materials. Regular students, they may not need supplemental materials. To be honest, they may need supplemental materials. Um, but for our language learning students, they're probably going to need some extra work. So they're going to have regular homework. All right, no big deal. But they also may need... Um, they also may need extra stuff. You may need to give them, you know, real life uh, objects. You may want to give them pictures to help them understand or grapple with uh, concepts and ideas. <coughs> Visuals, multimedia. You may want to do some scaffolding. Give them a demonstration of what it means to, uh, you know, to start a fire or, you know, whatever it is you're doing. You know, to, uh, what it means to... Uh, um, you know, to mount a horse. Uh, again, I don't know what it is that you're dealing with, but you may want to do some type of a demonstration to help them see that. YouTube would be a great thing there, right? Again, it's going to be helping them along. You may want to find related literature. Um, you know, there you're talking about uh, flying overseas or, or taking a boat over, and they may never have experience. I don't know what it is. Well, you may have some related literature about, you know, boat life in that time or, or, or whatever. Something that may be missing in their background. I don't know. You may have graded readers. They may be supposed to be reading the actual book, but you may have a graded reader, kind of a help along so that they can grasp ideas. Um, any number of things that you can do that are beyond what's these normally in their regular classroom so that you can help them out. This is all, this whole thing about supplemental materials is nothing more than scaffolding. Going back to the Vygotsky idea of uh, uh, getting people alongside to help you to move to move along. Okay, so the, uh, in part of this lesson planning you may want to use, and I would recommend that you have supplemental materials. Uh, to be honest, with the supplemental materials, uh, and even this, this element here about adapting content, all of these uh, ideas you're going to want to have you want to build a database of materials. You want to just have a whole bunch of materials at the ready so that if someone needs something, you can go and do that. Now, as you're starting out, you may not have those materials. Thank you, Internet. There are tons and tons of materials that are available online. And so you can thank those people for making materials available for you. At the same time, materials you make, you should try to make available to others. Right? Iron sharpens iron, so that we can have this list, this group of ready-made materials. Um, okay, adapting, I'm sorry, adapting content. So you may have a, a, a certain type of content for, for your students, but it's not going to be good enough for them. Um, they may need extra help. And so what you can do is that you can create some uh, uh, extra things. So, for example, uh, if you're talking about writing a, a paper to high schoolers and they pretty much they know how to write a paper for your, for your uh, ESL learners, your English language learners, you provide a graphic organizer. Try to help them figure out how that goes. Or, or you provide uh, an outline. 
right, to help them better understand. Um, if you're if they're supposed to be covering again some form of uh, uh, U.S. history, you may you may have study guides. If they're reading a textbook, you may have those uh, you know those cheat notes. I forget the name that they're called that, that native speakers use, but you might have those for for your uh, ELLs. You may have supplemental audio material so that not only can they read it, but they can also hear it. Um, um, so you, you may have that extra stuff. You may just have a, a text or notes that have you know marginal side notes to help them understand a little bit more what's going on, providing that extra push, that extra scaffolding that they need. Um, you, you may have L1 language support. Um, again, some people are going to frown on this. You should encourage them to stay away from L1 language support. There are other schools that are going to deliberately bring a language uh, specialist in who knows their language to help them out. Um, and it might be the other way around. Instead of a pull in, instead of a push in, they might have a pull out program where the student gets pulled out for a certain time of the day for, for them to learn extra things. Um, but there comes a point, at least in my opinion, and I'm agreeing with the book if this is actually in here, because I don't remember if I was this in here. There comes a point where there is a, uh, the threshold of, of pressure and stress is too high. And so I'm going to jump into L1 to try to lower that stress. Uh, stress is not a bad thing. Too much stress, in my opinion, is going to be a bad thing. Where's that level? I don't, I don't know where it is, but it is somewhere. If you've studied language, you'll know there are times where you just too much stress. And what do you do normally? You shut off. Okay, you see, I'm going to live with the ambiguity. That's a good language learner. But there are going to be some people who get too frustrated. So we pull the bar down a little. Right? At least that's what I would do. Um, okay. Evaluating um, PSYOP, the protocol. Um, and they go through a variety of uh, examples here of people who are doing and teaching and what was good about it. And then we, we evaluate them. Was this good? Was this not good? Uh, I'm not going to go into details here. I do like the breakdown that they have in the textbook with regard to uh, you know, their content objectives, their language objectives. Do they have all those elements? And this is really how it's done uh, when you're going to do an observation. You're going to have kind of like a checklist. You're going to have a place to describe, okay, this was done, that was done, this was done properly, this was included. And uh, so if you were going to be actually doing the observation, the OP part of this, the observation protocol, that's what you would do, okay? All right, so, and that's it for this chapter, I believe. If you, oh, hey, let's run through these uh, three things here real quick. If you do have questions about the textbook, though, please ask. Um, don't raise your hands now, because that's not going to help. Get on the boards or get on your email and uh, ask me about it. Real quick, let's talk a little bit about up-down processing, Bix and Calp, and then uh, your critiques that are going to be due pretty soon. All right, up, up processing and down processing, right? Um, this is the way people organize things in your mind. And I know I've covered this in another class, but since it's here, we're going to do it again. Uh, there are some people who like to live in the big picture and things that hey, they understand the big picture, but they don't understand the details. Okay? And there are other people who can understand all those little details, but they can't put it all together to get this big picture. Both types of processes are very important to language learning. Now, traditionally, people are strong in one or the other, right? They're not they're not strong in both. And you as a language teacher now, you want to try to encourage your students to be able to look both at the big picture and then at the little details so that you can do you can help them to become stronger language learners. Another aspect that you want to have them focus on is the concept of Bix and Kelp, and we all know what these are, right? What is Bix? Okay, I hope you know, because if you don't, you're going to have to go look it up. And CALP has been listed in this textbook several times, uh, which is more the focus of this is CALP um, in, uh, in terms of being uh, academic. Um, but we're gonna, you're going to want to have to work with both uh, when you're in the public school system. Obviously, CALP is going to be more important to be living and surviving and doing things in the classroom. But outside of the classroom, on the playground, and in the cafeteria, uh, when they're with other people, they're going to want to know BICs as well. So there's going to be a good mix here that you're going to want to have. And you should try to be emphasizing those as well as your traditional language learning. Okay? All right, finally, your uh, critiques. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're going to have a critique due here actually this week. 
Uh, there's a critique due here, and it should be due by the end of the week, and that means uh, uh, Saturday night or Sunday will be the deadline for it to be put up on uh, online. Please make sure that you get that done. If you do have questions about it, uh, you should let me know. This particular one should be related to uh, math which we haven't even really talked about in any detail. It's going to be very difficult for you to find math-related English language um, teaching methods or research because there's just not that much out there. In fact, one of the articles that may be in the, uh, the doc sharing um, up here, I think there's an article up there that actually talks about uh, if you're going to be teaching uh, English language learners, the easiest thing for you to do is to teach math because it's more universal. I have to laugh at that because, again, New York State says you have to have a some, some places have a whole lesson, a whole uh, course on teaching math to ELLs. Uh, when really all it is is the same idea, again, of uh, understanding the content math and then understanding um, content-based instruction. Okay, and so anyway, you're going to have difficulty finding it. Good luck. You'll want to find a, a research journal or a like a TESOL or second language research or um, uh, the like. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of journals out there that may have useful materials. You may also run across uh, um, teaching ideas. Uh, someone has an idea for teaching math uh, as opposed to an actual research about someone who tried to do it uh, or the like. Okay? And that's all for this lesson. I hope you guys have a good day. I'll try to get this up ASAP, and I'll also get on to the next chapter. Have a nice day now. Bye-bye.